So this is our third video in general principles of orthopedic trauma. Um, we've already covered uh, fracture basics, uh, clinical uh, assessment and x-ray, uh, radiologic assessment. Um, now we're going to talk about treatment. So when a fracture occurs, the bone heals itself by regenerating new bone tissue rather than healing with scar tissue. So the reason why um, kind of highlight that is because um, you know, if you cut your skin, uh, if you damage your liver, if you, um, you know, have other other injuries um, to, to tissues in the body, uh, many of those tissues heal with scar or with fibrosis um, and not necessarily by regenerating new tissue. Um, now if bone all you know, all healed with uh, scar tissue, you would never have, you would never restore um, mechanical stability. Um, so uh, bone, uh, and when a fracture occurs, bone heals by regenerating new bone tissue uh, and eventually remodels it over time to restore mechanical uh, integrity and, uh, um, and Sometimes when it doesn't heal, it only forms fibrous tissue, but we'll get to that in, in, in another portion of this lecture. Now, treatment um, is typically in the form of assisting that healing process by optimizing fracture alignment, which we'll also call a reduction, meaning like a fracture reduction is when you, you know, uh, essentially set it back in place um, by whatever means you're, you're, you're employing. Uh, we can assist it by optimizing articular alignment. So if there's an intra-articular fracture with a step-off or joint depression, for instance, we can restore that or reduce that back to its more anatomic position. We can optimize uh, length, rotation, and, and the local environment. Um, so overall treatment options for fractures include closed reduction in casting, uh, shown uh, here, a long leg cast, uh, open reduction and internal fixation, uh, which is typically in the form of some type of plate and screw fixation. So here you can see this ulna fracture goes on to get treated with this plate and screw fixation through a surgery called open reduction internal fixation. Uh, you can perform external fixation, and there's a few uh, examples of uh, external fixators shown here for a tibia. Uh, here you have a uh, sort of standard um, uh, monolateral external fixator frame. Uh, in this example, you have a circular external fixator, uh, and, and typically there are sometimes transfiction wires that go all the way um, across, something like this. Um, oh, I'm sorry, something, well, they go they attach to the ring, so I should sh show that a little bit more accurately. So there would be something like this. Um, and uh, here you can see an example of uh, a fixator that has uh, uh, pins that go in the bone here and here, and then also have these transfiction wires shown over there. Um, intramedullary rotting uh, is a device when you, when you place essentially a rod, you can see here, uh, inside the bone. Uh, so here the red lines represent the fracture and you see this rod inside the femur with some screws, uh, one up in the head and uh, two down in the distal femur uh, called, uh, well these are called interlocking screws and this is a different type of screw that goes up into the femoral head but needless to say the implant by and large is intramedullary uh, to contrast with the plate and screws that sits on the outside or the, on the cortical side of the bone. Okay, and then one type, uh, I didn't show an image here, is uh, arthroplasty. And arthroplasty is essentially a joint replacement. So that is something that you can do for certain articular fractures uh, or periarticular fractures. So casting and bracing is indicated when fracture alignment is acceptable, uh, when immediate joint motion is not necessary, and surgery perhaps is contraindicated. So some type of fractures uh, simply don't need to have surgery and it's okay to immobilize them. Um, and uh, I just put this picture because I think it's a neat picture, uh, but he actually did undergo uh, 
surgery on his leg and then was also immobilized in a cast afterwards. Uh, but this is an example of a short leg cast, simple, similar to what you will be doing in your, in your lab. So um, some basic principles that will be reinforced in the lab. You want to make sure you pad all bony prominences. You allow for some swelling, um, which is very easy with splints, but with casts it's uh, not so easy. And sometimes if you need to allow for a lot of swelling, you have to, you have to split a cast uh, or just use a splint. Um, you need adequate analgesia and possibly muscle relaxation for closed reduction techniques. So if you're going to literally set a fracture in place that's very much out of place, you, you'll need to do that and um, possibly even anesthesia. So to close reduce a fracture, so let's say you have this, this is a, uh, this example here is a distal radius fracture. Uh, you can see it's uh, kind of angulated, that's a little exaggerated, but it's angulated. Um, in order to reduce this, you're going to apply three-point pressure. So you're going to push down here, you're going to push up here, and then to prevent the whole arm from moving, you need to have a third point here. Uh, if you take the third point away, uh, essentially you just uh, um, you, know, you lose control of, of this rest of the arm here, okay? So to stabilize that, you need this three-point uh, contact. Casting is very technique dependent in order to achieve good results. Uh, it can be done with plaster or fiberglass. Fiberglass is used more often, although plaster certainly still serves a role. And plaster is also much, much cheaper. So some places only have plaster available um, because of that. Keep in mind that casts sound benign, uh, but uh, you can certainly have complications with casts, uh, including loss of reduction. So uh, the fracture that you set slips back out of place again. If you apply too aggressive of a three-point mold, you can get pressure necrosis. So if your cast is not well padded and you um, use uh, a poor technique uh, or if you just have a patient with poor skin and soft tissue, you can get, get this pressure necrosis. You can also get a compartment syndrome if you cast something that's really inappropriate to cast because there's excessive swelling and the swelling has nowhere to go. Uh, we'll get into compartment syndrome in another lecture. Uh, you can get thermal necrosis, so if you're, again, inadequately padded and uh, maybe you use hot water and then you get thermal reaction on top of that um, with the cast setting, um, you can get a burn. Uh, and when you remove casts, if you're not careful, uh, this can happen as well. Another form of treatment is open reduction internal fixation, or ORAF. This is something that's indicated when anatomic reduction of a fracture is necessary. So if you really need to piece something back together, uh, because that's the best thing for that patient for that uh, particular injury, then um, you need to do this. And, and frequently, fractures that involve a joint surface um, are the classic example where you'll have to do this um, because you don't want to have step-offs, you want to have the joint lined up appropriately, and you want to potentially allow some early joint motion to prevent stiffness. So here's an example of a scaphoid treated with a screw. Uh, here's uh, uh, an, an image. This is actually uh, Bono from U2 after his uh, bike crash in New York City, and this is something that was published in the, in the press. I didn't get a hold of this uh, um, from any physician. This was widely circulated. This is an image of his um, distal humerus uh, undergoing uh, reconstruction uh, for a comminuted, presumably comminuted intraarticular distal humerus fracture. Uh, and here's an example of an extraarticular fracture, uh, but a fracture that uh, just happens to be best treated with this technique, ORIF. Um, don't need you to know too much detail here, but just a few basic principles because you may hear these uh, terms being thrown around. But bone heals well with compression techniques um, if you're going to operate on them. Um, bone can heal with either absolute 
um, or relative stability. So absolute stability is, uh, for instance, when you do this compression techniques, uh, there's an example shown here uh, of a lag screw compression technique, um, or can heal with relative stability. So if you put an intramedullary nail in a femur fracture, as shown before, that is not a compression technique, but certain fractures can still heal very well that way. Occasionally, errors with internal fixation can lead to problems with the bone not healing or the plate. In this case, you can see, I don't know if you look very carefully, you can see the plate is actually broken here. Okay, so um, those are the two ends of the plate. Um, sometimes the plate may be too thin, too thick, insufficient cortices were engaged, there's too much of a gap at the fracture site, eventually becomes a non-union. This is just an example of what happened in this particular case, uh, but uh, you know, highly technique dependent. External fixation, as I uh, mentioned, can look something like this. Uh, it's indicated when surgical reduction and stabilization are needed, but casting and internal fixation are contraindicated for whatever reason. So some examples are severe open fractures where you have poor soft tissue coverage and perhaps you're concerned that uh, uh, an implant may be exposed to contamination and um, uh, get infected uh, even after initial treatment. Um, uh, it may be an ex a, a case where you could use external fixation if there's a, if there's a bone infection and you don't want to put um, sort of an indwelling uh, metal implant in there because external fixators are always removable. Uh, you can use it in a case where the bony anatomy is not amenable to internal fixation devices. So if there's some deformity, if there's some issue where um, simply um, our usual internal fixation devices don't fit, let's say, then external fixation can be a little bit more versatile. It can be a portable traction technique for periarticular fractures. So let's say if you have, and I'll draw the talus here, uh, let's say you have a very comminuted fracture in the ankle joint and uh, the, it's shortened, the bone, the foot is just, you know, impacted up into here and you need to get it out to length. You may do an external fixator where you put pins in the foot, connect it to pins uh, above the ankle and uh, then you distract. You just pull these in two different directions and then you lock up the external fixator. Uh, and, and it can be temporary. In that case, that may be a temporary technique or it could be definitive. It could be, you know, this, this, for instance, this person with this severe open fracture never gets the best soft tissue coverage uh, and you don't want to have a plate sitting in there. Well, an external fixator can then stay there uh, until the bone heals. Intramedullary nailing, kind of mentioned this already. Uh, it's indicated when only gross fracture alignment is necessary to restore function. So it's not typically a compression technique or something that, like in the joint when you're piecing all these articular fragments together. It's typically for diaphyseal fractures, mostly the tibia and femur, uh, but sometimes in upper extremity fractures. Um, it requires a patent medullary canal without pre-existing deformities because the, the rods we have, they're rigid. They only come in certain shapes and sizes. Uh, so if you have somebody who has a deformity for whatever reason, um, sometimes the rods we have may not fit into their medullary canal or if their canal is obliterated for whatever reason uh, or just too narrow um, because that's the patient is a small patient, sometimes you can't just fit a rod in there. Not, the, not at least not a commercially available rod that you would otherwise use. So as I mentioned, arthroplasty is like a joint replacement. So it's indicated for articular and periarticular fractures where repair is not possible and replacement's the only good option to return to function. Um, one example is a displaced femoral neck fracture in the elderly. Um, not really an articular fracture, but it's a periarticular fracture. And in those cases, the blood supply can be compromised, and uh, we'll get into this in, a, in, a, in, a, um, in the next section of the, of the lecture. Um, comminuted radial head fracture is another example, uh, or a head splitting proximal humerus fracture in the elderly. These are examples where an arthroplasty may be done. So I'm actually going to pause here, and uh, we're going to um, 
like I said, get into a, just a few slides on hip fractures since it's a common injury you may all encounter and some associated uh, uh, conditions in the, in the next video. Thanks.